Um, let's get started. Um, it is 9.01 now um, in Mountain Time, and I would like to begin um, by recognizing the lands of the Pueblo people on which the sites of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum stand. We recognize and honor their elders past and present and celebrate the vitality of their people today and into future generations. I offer this with humility and gratitude and acknowledgement of the need to confront the ongoing injustices of settler colonialism. I would like to extend a thank you to our members and donors who are here today. Your support made this event possible. If you are not a member yet and enjoy this program, please consider joining today. Visit gokm.org slash membership to learn more. Throughout this talk, please place your questions in the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on your device. We'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of our conversation. For the duration of this lecture, the chat has been disabled. It might have already been um, disabled um, by now, but um, we've been we've been practicing different ways to approach um, the chat box. So it might also be, um, you might be able to type into it now. Please note that following today's talk, a recording will be made available on the O'Keeffe Museum's website in about a week's time. Captions in both English and Spanish will be available. Now it is my pleasure to present um, our speaker for today. Um, our speaker is Pamela W. Hawks. Pamela is an architect specializing in contemporary design within historic settings. She is a principal with Scattergood Design in Portland, Maine, and for the past seven years served as professor of practice in historic preservation at the University of Pennsylvania's Weitzman School of Design. In more than 30 years of practice, she has directed a wide variety of award-winning projects throughout the United States, including strategies for heritage sites owned by the National Park Service and National Trust for Historic Preservation, as well as numerous civic and cultural organizations. She has consulted on the challenges of museums set in historic sites as diverse as the 18th century McClellan House at the Portland Maine Museum of Art, Frank Lloyd Wright's Price Tower in Tulsa, and the Chinati Foundation in Marfa, Texas. Pamela was a teenager when Life Magazine's cover story on Georgia O'Keeffe appeared, and she has been honored to collaborate on the conservation for O'Keeffe's home and studio in Abiquiu. Pamela, how are you doing today? I'm well. Thank you so much, Chikle. It's such a pleasure to be participating in Mornings with O'Keefe, which I've enjoyed attending in the past. I wish that we could all be together in Santa Fe, but I'm also excited that this information will be reaching so many different people in so many different places. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and uh, Chikle, it just says I can't start. Uh oh. So you Let's... need to enable it, I think. Do you want to try it again? Uh, yes, it's OK. So it's, uh, I just need to check to make sure you're all seeing that. Yes. Super. Um. So today I'd like to share some insights about the past, present, and future of the site of the O'Keeffe Home and Studio in Abiquiu that were gained through our work on the conservation assessment. The museum engaged us in the fall of 2018, and we completed the report in January 2020, then followed up with a window conservation prototype that was implemented last spring. I must begin by acknowledging the exceptional multidisciplinary team who worked on the project. The Georgia O'Keeffe Museum staff were active participants in assessments and workshops, and those who had worked for Ms. O'Keeffe on site provided a unique perspective. Our consultants, our professional consultants came from around the country, each brought distinct skills and experience, as well as fresh eyes to the site. Our work was greatly informed by research that had been commissioned by the museum that included the book, Georgia O'Keeffe and Her Houses, 
by Barbara Bueller Lines and Agapita Judy Lopez, published in 2012, a historic structure report by Jonathan Craig, architect, and a cultural landscape report prepared by the School of Architecture at the University of New Mexico, which was completed after our work. All of these deepened our understanding of the site and ultimately of anyone who visits. The conservation study considered issues both local and global, from the makeup of the adobe walls to the potential impact of climate change on the site. As the lecture title suggests, our investigations were built on an understanding of the approach that Ms. O'Keefe and her friend Maria Chabot took to the restoration of the site in the 1940s on the values that they shared there then, as well as the values associated with the site today. I assume that you're all familiar with Georgia O'Keeffe's art, but you may not have visited her home and studio. O'Keeffe owned two homes in Abiquiu, New Mexico, an adobe revival house built at Ghost Ranch in 1933, which you see on the left, which she purchased in 1940, and the traditional 19th century compound in the center of the village on the right, which she acquired in 1945. The home and studio, which was the focus of our conservation assessment, served as her primary residence from 1949 to 1984. This combined site and floor plan shows the garden located to the south of the main house and her studio and bedroom located in a former carriage house, which are perched to the north on the edge of the bluff. O'Keeffe's modernist aesthetic was expressed not only through her art, but also her clothing and lifestyle. The restoration and remodeling of the home and studio through 45 years of ownership was part of the remarkable synthesis of her art and life. She seems to have had an eye for architecture early on. The images on the left is from a portfolio made during her art studies at the University of Virginia in 1912, which was recently posted on the museum's Instagram account. It reminded me of how many of her paintings have buildings as the subject, even before she arrived in Abiquiu. The view on the right of the family home of Alfred, her husband, Alfred Stieglitz in Lake George was painted in 1928. When asked about the home and studio in Abiquiu, O'Keeffe emphasized her artistic, we might even say irrational desire to acquire what was then described as a ruin. Quote, the door, that door to the Salida in the patio is what made me want to buy this house. I waited 10 years to get the house because of that door. There were also practical reasons for the purchase. Since 1936, she'd spent summers at Ghost Ranch where provisioning was an all day affair over bumpy dirt roads, even in the best of summer weather. The Abiquiu site was near Bodie's General Store as it is today and had access to village water rights with the promise of a garden and fresh produce. O'Keefe later confessed to her friend, Miriam Beltran, quote, it isn't really my idea of a house. It is an old one that grew by being added to and I have tried to make it my, mine. In the 1970s, the artist declared, quote, I didn't want a Spanish house. I didn't want an Indian house or a Mexican house. I wanted my house, and I think I succeeded fairly well. Much of the credit for making it O'Keeffe's house, as well as the restoration and design strategy, goes to her friend, Maria Chabot. The artist herself clarified that, quote, Maria had wanted to do the house. She had friends in Santa Fe who had done a house. She was crazy to do a house and she was crazy to do this house. This image shows the two in the courtyard of O'Keeffe's house at Ghost Ranch. Maria Chabot, who lived from 1913 to 2001, had arrived in Santa Fe in the 1930s. She was part of a remarkable circle of women there who included her lifelong friend, artist Dorothy Stewart, Stuart's sister, Margareta D Stuart Dietrich, and Kate Chapman, wife of archaeologist Kenneth Chapman, pictured on the left. And I think this view gives you some sense about the spirit of those women and the, what it was like to be in Santa Fe in those days. 
Chabot's, quote, friends in Santa Fe had done more than one house there as part of a growing interest in preserving and replicating the historic character of the evolving community. Among them was a property on Canyon Road, which Dietrich acquired in 1928, shown on the right. Known as El Saguan, the site is now the headquarters of the historic Santa Fe Foundation. My work on the conservation study began with a search to understand what had been done during the restoration of the site at Abiquiu and why. O'Keefe lived primarily in New York City during the three years of restoration while she settled the estate of her husband, Alfred Stieglitz. Chabot sur supervised the work on site, corresponding frequently with O'Keefe with questions and strategies. We're so fortunate that their words have been preserved in these letters, now in the archives of the museum and transcribed in a book by Barbara Bueller Lines and Ann Payden titled Maria Chabot, Georgia O'Keeffe, Correspondence 1941 to 49. Chicle will send you details on these resources after the lecture. How much restoration actually took place? O'Keeffe talked years afterwards about the site being a ruin, but in my experience, it's not uncommon for homeowners to emphasize their heroic ef rescue efforts. So I was a bit skeptical. Here are images <clears throat> of the main entry to the house that show its appearance in 1918 on the left and in, three decades later in the center when, when O'Keefe purchased the house. The Eastern part of the house where the Saguan is located had been occupied the, by the sheriff of Abiquiu and his family until 1935. Roofs had fallen in on the Western portion of the house, but Chabot's images and letters indicate that many other roofs were still functional. I, I studied about two dozen photographs that Chabot made to document the construction process. They didn't capture the whole site, but I could overlay them on laser scanned elevations of the existing walls to get a better sense of what historic adobe might remain. Comparing that with O'Keefe and Chabot's floor plan drawings and their descriptions of the work, I've come to believe that much of the work constituted repair and conservation, with the exception of the studio structure, the former carriage house, where walls were largely rebuilt and modified to suit the new function. These adobe walls and the large windows within them were a focus of our work for several reasons. The large windows greatly exceed the traditional span for adobe, and no one was sure exactly how they were supported. And the adobe had been covered with two layers of cement stucco. The cement stucco protects the adobe from rain, but retards drying of any moisture that might be absorbed by the adobe from other sources, such as soil moisture or roof leaks. That can lead to unseed, accelerated deterioration of the adobe wall below the hard plaster. To make matters worse, the stucco and wire reinforcement effectively prevent us from seeing cracks or other early warning signs of failure. Adobe or earthen architecture is an ancient building tradition. Tony Crosby, the adobe expert on our team, has worked for two decades on conservation of 5,000-year-old mud brick structures in Egypt. Though earthen architecture is most common in areas that are hot and dry, it's also found in England and Canada. In the New Mexico tradition, relatively thin bricks are made of clay and sand and mixed with straw to reduce shrinkage, then dried in the sun. O'Keefe's Abiquiu neighbors did the work on the house and this image shows new bricks being made on the hillside overlooking the village. During the winter of 1946, Chabot mused to O'Keefe, quote, probably everyone in the village subconsciously has always wanted to make the old ru ruin live again, wanted to, make it, wanted to see it made neat. I cannot otherwise explain their avidity to work for us when they will not work for anyone else. Traditional adobe is finished with a layer of clay stucco to protect the bricks and mortar from rain and wind. It's often done by the women homeowners as pictured in the print on the right from a book titled Adobe Notes or How to Keep the Weather Out with Just Plain Mud. 
modern cement stuccos had gained popularity in New Mexico beginning in the early decades of the 20th century. Dorothy Stewart and Kate Chapman, Chabot's friends, had written this booklet in 1930 as a, to try to counteract the trend. And it's recently been reprinted with a terrific introduction by Catherine Colby. The text is full of practical tips and philosophical advice and resonates so strongly with Chabot's words to O'Keefe that it's easy for me to imagine that Chabot kept the Adobe book close at hand while she was working. Chabot did persuade O'Keefe to finish her home and studio with mud plaster, and a team of seven local, local women worked throughout the summer of 1947 to coat the house and garden wall. While restoring the adobe walls, O'Keefe and Chabot made subtle modifications to modernize the appearance of the house. They chose not to restore the roof figas, for example, which originally extended beyond the walls. Compare these before and after photos. O'Keefe emphasized the flat sculptural surface of the wall in her paintings rather than their rich patina. But nonetheless, the artist treasured how the traditional mud plaster captured both the native earth color and the marks of those who made it. In 1957, she told a friend, quote, we are plastering the house. Two women are doing it and it makes me feel that mud is a really warm, live experience. End quote. The most visible modernist interventions are the five large windows created in the north and east walls of the house and studio, which offer stunning views of the house of the landscape. Maria Chabot suggested that O'Keefe locate her studio in the former carriage house because, quote, the big window can be 16 feet long if you wish and 10 feet high. It will give you all of the mesas of the white place and the mountain above and all the valley of the Chama below. And indeed, it certainly did. Planning was one thing and execution another. The two women were keen on using modern materials anywhere that they could and considered thermoplane or double glazing, which was just coming into production. They nixed that plan, however, once they learned the cost of such large units. Chabot reported in 1947, quote, I have been to Santa Fe. I was with Frank Thompson, the carpenter. We spent the whole evening figuring windows, end quote. We're not quite sure what that meant, but the next year she declared, quote, the I-beam is in place over your studio window. Also, the steam steel beams of your bedroom are in place. That was a job. Two men from Santa, the two men from Santa Fe and all the Abiquiu townsmen the view is really incredible. Chabot was aware that these modernist interventions also were at odds with traditional preservation. In a letter written in 1947, she complained to O'Keefe that the carpenters, quote, want to kill me because I insist on the old doors, the bleached wood, the uneven, unstandard edge. She also noted the trouble is you want a native house with modern windows, water, lights, and that means a kind of structure that really isn't native. So the native is all sort of sham or else the modernism is really a farce. It's hard to do a hybrid. These words sound to me very much like today's Secretary of the Interior's standards for treatment of historic properties, which were created two decades after Chabot wrote. The, the Secretary of the Interior's principles have guided work by the National Park Service, state and local preservation groups, and say in part that, quote, each property will be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use, end quote. Ultimately, the Abiquiu site reflects an appropriate and forward-thinking compromise in which much of the original fabric was preserved while inserting modern elements at key spots. O'Keefe continued to make modifications after she moved into the house and Chabot was no longer involved, and all of them give the building its character. One later intervention was the stucco. Mud plaster is what we would call a sacrificial coating. That is, the outer layer is washed away by rain and mud and must be traditionally reapplied every few years. In Adobe Notes, Dorothy Stewart and Kate Chapman admitted that, quote, 
replastering an adobe house means simply taking from the dooryard the dirt that is washed down from the walls and putting it back on top of the walls again every third year, end quote. The photos that we looked at earlier taken of the site in 1918 and 1946 show how rapidly mud plaster and adobe bricks beneath them deteriorate if the finish is not kept up. O'Keefe had already found the process tiresome at Ghost Ranch and applied cement stucco there in 1941. That's why she pushed back at Chabot. By 1959, the walls at Abiquiu had been replastered eight times and the local source of good clay had been exhausted. Reluctantly, O'Keefe directed that the walls be covered with cement stucco. Quote, it will probably be horrid, end quote, she told her sister. And she escaped to Ghost Ranch so she wouldn't have to watch. Was she right? Look at the contrast and texture between the photo on the left, taken by O'Keefe probably just before the original finish was covered, and the photo on the right, made by Laura Gilpin in 1960 after the stucco, cement stucco was applied. Why should we care? Well, first, because it shows us something about O'Keefe's aesthetics. Remember that door in the patio, the one that made her buy the house? Architectural historian Sarah Vo Rovang has done research on O'Keeffe's use of modern materials at the site. She points out that between the late 1940s and 1960, quote, O'Keeffe painted this patio door in the Plazuela approximately two dozen times, and you see three of those paintings here. Rovang continues, quote, after the house was stuccoed in 1959, O'Keefe executed only one more painting of the patio door, white patio with red door, in 1960. While it's possible that she simply felt finished with the series, it's also possible that O'Keefe's attraction to the patio door wasn't merely about the door itself, but the relationship between the void of the door and the richly textured adobe wall around it, end quote. Rovang further notes, quote, throughout the 1950s, O'Keefe sat for new, numerous portrait photos in front of the adobe plaster of the home's exterior. With few exceptions, this practice largely ceased after the house was stuccoed in 1959, end quote. Second, as I've already mentioned, the cement stucco can make the walls more vulnerable, as well as more difficult to monitor. At the home and studio, this was compounded by a second layer of cement stucco applied in 1995-96 after O'Keeffe's death. That brings us to our assessment of the adobe walls and windows, which took place during a two week-long site visits in April and May of 2000, 2019. Our adobe expert, Tony Crosby, began with careful documentation of existing conditions in sketch form, which you see here. Meanwhile, the team was trying a variety of non-destructive methods for documenting the adobe conditions with a goal of creating a monitoring program that the museum's own conservation experts could use in the future. Unfortunately, stucco, its wire reinforcement and vo the voids left from detached nails prevent the use of many non-destructive test methods. Infrared thermal imaging or capacitance type moisture meters rely on comparing the readings of thermal, acoustical, or electrical continuity um, in solid walls uh, and get the changes to, with gaps to identify changes in adobe condition. Surface penetrating radar proved useful in locating those steel lintels spanning the wide window openings in the studio in O'Keeffe's bedroom that Chabot had described in her letters. As you see in this image of Dave Woodham, structural engineer from ANA in Denver at work. Manual resistance drilling is commonly used to gauge the relative density in adobe brick. Low resistance, that is ease in drilling, advancing the drill, indicates low density, which correlates with moisture damage. Where observations suggested likely deterioration, the areas on the house were probed with moist MRD. Though it lacked the resolution repeatability necessary for long-term monitoring, MRD provided a good indicator of potential problem areas 
especially when combined with insertion of a fiber optic video scope, which provides views of a hole drilled through the wall assembly. And you can see some of those images of materials, material conditions, voids, and discontinuities in the images on the, in the, images on the left. The video scope also allowed Dave Woodham to confirm the large that the large openings over the garage, kitchen, and lower bedroom were supported by a composite sandwich of two by 12 members. And you hear, see some of the team members here um, looking at what he's found. Um, and then the graph, which diagrams the relative um, density across the, uh, actually the relative deflection of that very, very wide lintel opening, which was one of the largest areas of concern. Here, Dave's operating a resistograph, a machine designed for timber, which records, records the degree of resistance of a drill as it advances through a bore. The resistance can be correlated to material density or compressive strength based on laboratory testing, and has been used extensively for wood, mortar, and stone. This quantitative documentation is superior to and no more invasive than the qualitative assessment of manual resistance drilling that we used to begin with. Laboratory testing is currently underway by ANA through a grant from the National Center for Preservation Training and Technology to correlate the, the um, DRM readings with adobe density and moisture content since that material has not been extensively studied. Finally, 24 by 24 inch panels of the cement stucco were removed in two locations where anomalies had been identified during the manual resistance drilling and other non-destructive examination. This was done with the assistance of Crocker Limited, Santa Fe contractors who are experts in adobe restoration. The probe allowed close examination, sampling, and documentation of the adobe bricks and joints, as well as remnants of mud plaster. which you see in the detail here. The conservation study confirmed that most, adobe, most of the adobe appears to be in good condition, and the lintels at the oversized openings of the home and studio provide adequate support for the walls and roof above. However, we remain concerned that the windows represented one of the site's greatest vulnerabilities. Historic photographs taken before the stucco application, which you see on the left, show a clear demarcation between the wood frame of the windows and the adobe, with projecting sills to protect the walls below. This detail is important as adobe and wood perform differently in response to changes in temperature and moisture, and have different service lives based on durability and maintenance. When the cement stucco was applied in 1959 and reapplied in or applied a, a, over that in 1995 to 96, the layers were lapped over the wood frames and sills, as you see on the right. Water drainage at the sills is poor, and the drying surface of the wood is reduced, creating the potential for water to penetrate the stucco wood intersection and enter the adobe. As a result, many of the sills and jams are in poor condition, some completely rotted, providing more opportunities for water to enter the adobe behind the stucco. Deterioration of the wood frames also reduces their capacity to resist wind loads and can weaken the vertical support of the glass, a concern for those large openings. Progressive damage to, to adobe or wood frames could have serious structural implications for vertical loads from the roof vigas and lateral loads from wind. Developing an assessment and repair strategy for the large windows was a high priority. And in the spring and summer of 2021, the museum engaged the conservation study team to undertake a pilot project with the assistance of Ed and Jess Crocker of Crocker Limited and support provided by Heritage Partnerships Program of the National Park Service. Work focused on the window in the north wing of the lower bedroom chosen because it was far from the most iconic views of the site and next to those probes that we had done earlier. Cement stucco was removed to examine the condition of the adobe and wood framing on all sides of the window 
and to draw, document its construction details, supplementing our previous um, investigations. And on the right, you see um, the the um, lines in different colors, which Dale Cronkright, the head of conservation for the museum, made to explain to us about the different layers of stucco that he had seen. I would add that because much of this work was done during COVID, um, most of the team members actually had to do this investigation remotely with the museum staff holding the video camera for us to watch. The on-site um, explorations and laboratory testing indicated that the built-up 27 inch by 27 inch long timber header or lintel spanning the opening was relatively intact. The simple wood frames, which had consist of nominal lumber with a quarter rounds holding the plate glass in place, also appeared adequate to support the glass at anticipated wind loads. The team's, the goal of the prototype had been to develop new window details that could improve maintenance and performance. However, given the relatively good performance of the Adobe window assembly over 70 years, the team elected a conservation approach, approach that is leaving the window sash and frame in place with some improvements. Those included adding gringo blocks to the, tie the frame into the Adobe, which you see in the right-hand slot um, image, using stainless steel fasteners on the lintel, which you see on the left, adding copper flashing under the sill, fastening a new strip of wood on the outer edge of the ex existing frame to perceive the lath and, and create a recess for sealant, and tooling the new stucco to create a drip edge before it intersects with the head of the window frame, which you see on the left. Which work was completed in the spring of 2022. And if you visit the site today, I hope you'll find that the window now gives um, is that the work is relatively invisible while also giving a better impression of the house as O'Keefe knew it. The original mud finish had been, has been covered on the exterior, but it remains on the walls and the floors inside the house, as you can see on the right. Those finishes are renewed regularly by Mino Lopez, continuing a tradition that he began while working for Ms. O'Keefe. These and other fragile finishes in the house were studied by Dorothy Crosser of Building Conservation Associates, our materials con conservator, with a view toward confirming original materials, as well as identifying the impact of visitors on the house. Visitation to the home and studio has increased steadily from 6,300 in 2007, when the museum began counting, to over 16,000 in 2019. During the summer, Tours are often sold out well in advance, leading to frustration and complaints from tourists. Visitors are welcome, of course, but they can damage the physical fabric in many ways. Most rooms are accessed directly from the outside, so visitors track in abrade soil, partic soil particles, which can erode the floor finishes. Doorways and passages are narrow, and careless visitors can cause loss of wood and paint and plaster along the way. Visitors to the site often have a profoundly emotional experience, commenting how they can feel Ms. O'Keefe's spirit there. And I certainly um, believe that myself. But this experience can be diminished by congestion and fewer opportunities to pause and reflect to absorb the visual context that was so essential to O'Keefe's life. Fortunately, current museum leadership has resisted the temptation to increase tour size and frequency opting to offer new tours of the countryside and the spectacular landscapes associated with O'Keeffe's art. This helps ensure that the delicate finishes will endure for future generations. The conservation study also looked at the big picture, both global and local risks to the site, some of which you see listed here. As if to emphasize the site's vulnerability, on our, our site visit in April of 2019, coincided with the devastating fire of Notre Dame in Paris, which you see on the right of the slide. Wildfires in the vicinity of the Abiquiu site had already raised serious concerns among museum staff, recognizing that its interior contained fragile flammable materials like the traditional wood ceiling on the left. 
the Calf Canyon and Hermit's Peak fires in the spring of 2022 became the largest fire, wildfire in New Mexico history and further emphasized the value of planning. The O'Keefe Home and Studio, which is located in the red circle on this map, um, is relatively remote, 43 miles northwest of Santa Fe, 23 miles north of Los Alamos National Laboratory, and 7.2 miles south southeast of the Abiquiu Reservoir. The village of Abiquiu has about 23, 230 residents and is situated within the larger Pueblo of Abiquiu land grant, which is bounded by the Santa Fe National Forest on the east, south, and west, and Carson National Forest on the north. The home and studio are situated on a bluff overlooking the north edge of the village, overlooking US Highway 84 and the Rio Chama Valley. The Abiquiu Volunteer Fire Department has 20 firefighters and two fire stations. The primary one five miles from the home and studio, but located on the other side of the Rio Chama. It serves 360 square miles, making it one of the largest fire districts in New Mexico. Conservation engineer Michael Henry's recommendations included emergency planning, such as developing a site-specific emergency res response plan for the home and studio, working with Rio Arriba County Department of Emergency Preparedness to include the home and studio as a significant cultural and historic resource, um, and strategizing with the volunteer fire department on a site-specific firefighting plan for the home and studio that included traffic control, access and placement of firefighting apparatus, water supplies, and if needed, water supply shuttles. He also recommended looking uh, when the next, when the roof is next replaced, looking at possibilities for a higher uh, fire resistance in the roof assembly. And also as part of that work, upgrading smoke detection and providing central monitoring of the fire detection system within the house, uh, as well as invest investigating the feasibility of installing a low volume mist fire suppression system for the buildings. In addition to fire, Michael Henry considered the potential consequences of climate change on risks such as flooding, lightning, hail, and wind. Climate change is likely to introduce new factors or exacerbate existing conditions that pose both direct and indirect risks to the home and studio. For example, increased intensity and frequency of rain events may overload roof drains and drainage, increasing soil moisture that could be absorbed by the adobe or generating more extreme sh shrink and swell drawing of the soils. Wind events of higher frequency and speed may cause uplift and damage to the roofing. Early in the study, the team recommended that the museum install a weather station on site, shown on the left, which uploads data to a secure website, including air temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, rain and solar radiation. Interval cameras, shown on the right, were also discreetly installed to record wetting patterns on the walls from snow and rain. Those supplement the qualitative data captured by spot readings on, on sensors and will allow physical change at this remote site to be correlated with the weather. As a last resort, our work actually began with complete architectural documentation of the site and its buildings. The exterior and interior of the home and studio, as well as the site walls and bomb shelter were captured by Peter Oslestad of Oslestad's Consulting and represented in a dense three-dimensional point cloud, all sharing the same co coordinate system. This unified point cloud allowed Peter to extract a series of extremely accurate measured line drawings in, compute in CAD or computer-aided design format. The results were conventional exterior and interior sections and elevations, which you see here, which were critical for our documentation of existing conditions. The floor plans and reflected ceiling plans were further enriched by including the high resolution photograph imagery um, that were um, part of the uh, part of the photography. This level of documentation proved in, invaluable following the second disastrous fire of Charles Rennie McIntosh's Glasgow Scotland School of Art in 2018. 
Of course, we hope that the data will only be needed to develop conservation plans for the future. Georgia O'Keeffe's home and studio is not simply a building, but an expression of her modernist aesthetic and her personal values. Some of those adaptations have made the home and studio vulnerable. So has its change from a personal home to a museum. The age of the fabric and its complexity, increased wear and tear from visitation, and increased environmental stresses from climate change all pose challenges for continued stewardship of the home and studio. Our conservation assessment provides technical recommendations for addressing those conservation challenges, but implementation of them will take time and resources. I hope that this presentation has given you some insights into the evolution of the site, as well as the challenges ahead, and that you'll all have a chance to visit the Georgia O'Keeffe, O'Keeffe Home and Studio in the future. Thank you for listening. I look forward to answering your, hearing your comments and answering your questions. Thank you so much, Pamela. That was, wow, that was awesome. I mean, I really, I really learned so much. Um, there is so much I, I've, I've been to, um, you know, the, the, um, the home in Abiquiu and I've been up to Ghost Ranch as well. And there, I, I had no idea that there was so much that is not seen. Um, there's so much work that happens behind the scenes to make it look as pristine as it does. So, I mean, thank you so much for, for the work that y'all have done. This is really, this was really inf informational. Thank you so much. Um, Very welcome. We do have, um, we have a few questions in, okay. in the chat and I think that we've got some more coming in. Um, so folks, if I saw some folks um, put some questions into the chat, um, I can try to go back and try to find some of those, but preferably if you can bring that over into the Q&A section, um, that would be really helpful um, for me. Um, one of the questions, Pamela, is um, from someone named Pam. Um, Pam asks, I understand that it was very difficult to raise the Vigas in the studio. How was it done? Um, I do, I, I know Chabot described it. I can't remember the details. To be honest, that wasn't a key focus of my work, um, but I also encourage folks um, to, to get the book of letters, um, which describes all of this in wonderful detail. And there, there obviously are um, fantastic stories about other stuff that I, I couldn't include here. Absolutely. And I mean, and actually not only the Vs, but of course we wonder how they lifted that steel in place. Um, but um, my suspicion is that, um, you know, folks in the village and around in other areas learn how to do this work without machines. Um, it takes teamwork um, and good work together. And that's probably what happened there. Definitely. Um, someone also asked, um, and this might be this might be uh, an easy one for you to answer. And I, actually, I don't know if it's if you know it off the top of your, of your head. But what's the interior square footage of the main house? I don't know that off the top of my head, um, but I bet there is someone at the museum who does. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I could find it, um, and I yeah. might try to do that before the yeah. end. Um, as, as anyone who's been there knows, it's a very intimate house. Uh, and that's part of the challenge with the visitation. You, uh, anyone who's been there knows that you don't get to go into every room um, and the museum has to work carefully to, to figure out how they can give people a nice, a, a great glimpse of her, her, the places where she lived without worrying about how to squeeze people indoors and out the other. I mean, it wasn't designed as a, it wasn't designed as a tour site. It was designed as an intimate place where O'Keefe lived and entertained a few guests um, but she was not having big parties, um, and she was um, very much, um, you know, interested also in the connection between the inside of the house and the and the landscape around it. Definitely. Um, another question that came in, Pamela, um, and this one might I, I imagine we don't we probably don't have an answer for something like this, but. Anyway, the question is, what was the total cost of having this team of experts complete the study? But I also imagine maybe you can talk about 
sort of like the human cost, how many folks actually um, were involved in doing all of this. You were describing um, during COVID, you had to use cameras to be able to get into specific areas, which I think also, I mean, yeah, that's that's a real cost of like bringing so many different folks into into the frame. Well, it's a great question. I don't know the precise answer, but I know that um, work like this does cost money. It's 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 work that the museum must pay for. Um, I think in our case, it was funded uh, in part by a private donor, um, and we were really really fortunate. We actually started our work by writing a grant proposal uh, for the Getty Foundation, which wasn't funded, um, but someone else stepped up, and um, that that this is part of our work is often. Part of our work is often helping get the funding to do the work to begin with. Um, we had um, we had a team of six folks who traveled to the site in various ways. Uh, Peter Oslestad drove out in a station wagon because he had a lot of gear, and um, we worked over a period. We made uh, five site visits, um, not all of us, but most of us, and then uh, worked over a period of a year and a half. The museum also had a crew. Um, they had an amazing project manager who was organizing everything behind the team. So it's not only the cost of our time, but also the, the museum staff, which is supporting us. And um, the, I mean, the, I don't consider, I don't consider a human cost associated. And everyone I mentioned, you know, everyone I asked to be on our team was like, when do I get there? Um, and that was certainly true for me. Um, I've been, you know, was delighted to go back last year because there was a uh, international conference on earth and architecture that was held in Santa Fe. And we did two tours of the site as part of that. Um, and um, I'm delighted to help out in any way that I can. Um, and I think that's true for everyone else. You know, the reality is that um, our compensation often doesn't, I mean, I, I, reading those letters um, was like such a pleasure. Um, and I spent a lot of one winter doing that before we got out there. So um, there are definitely, um, everyone is, is a, contributes to it and was really, really important. Definitely. Um, and by the way, PETA is, PETA is joining us from, I imagine oh. from, um, she says that the main house is 5,246 square feet. The garage is 484 square feet and the studio measures at 1,595 square feet. Well, Thank you, PETA. Well, PETA knows everything. So PETA does I'm, know I'm glad she's, uh, she's here. Um, yeah, we have we have we have time for some more questions. So folks, feel free to um, keep dropping some questions into the chat. Um, another question that came in with a flat roof: How is drainage from rain managed? Such a good question. Um, the roof, the traditional adobe roof was. Uh, um, there are uh, canales, uh, which are gutters that basically shoot out over the walls, like. If you've ever seen the gargoyles on Notre Dame, it's essentially the same principle. So everyone knew that draining water over the walls was not a good idea with mud brick construction. So there are um, these uh, drainage pipes essentially that project out over the walls and disperse the wall, the, the water down below. Um, that was that's one of the things that we think um, is something that needs to be studied further as um, rain may increase um, so that we make sure that the water really gets away from the base of the walls. And that area that we looked at by the lower bedroom where we did the initial two um, uh, squares of removal of stucco and also looked at the large window there is an area where there have been problems with deterioration in the past. And in fact, if you look at the historic photographs, that corner, um, because the roofs actually sort of um, are over the individual rooms and they make their way down slope. Um, that was a vulnerability at the lower end of the slope. Um, and um, it's also a place where the water from the Sekia, which is one of the most beautiful and um, valuable features of the site, makes its way through the garden and then out through the backyard. Um, so there are a lot of places right in that particular area where water um, gathers that we were concerned about. Definitely. Thank you, Pamela. Mm -hmm. um, I answered this one in the chat, but somebody asked, 
um, if they can take a tour of these locations. And definitely, I dropped uh, the link into the chat. You can find that on our website. Um, someone also asked and um, about the bomb shelter that you mentioned, uh -huh. Pamela. Do you want to talk yeah. about that a little bit more? I will talk a little bit. Um, it's, you know, O'Keefe was living in the site in the 1950s. And um, Los Alamos was just 20 miles away. And um, I remember um, getting under my desk in elementary school and um, she was um, concerned and, and we had a bomb shelter in our house. So she, and she was in the middle of nowhere but knew that she was at high risk. So there is on the, you can't, it's not, there's only, you can only see the vent stack from the studio window but under the um, brow of the hillside is the doorway into the bomb shelter, which is um, really cool. It's just a small room with a um, few supplies in it. And um, it was um, built into this hillside. It is basically um, reinforced concrete construction. And we did do some ass um, assessments with the uh, ground penetrating radar to confirm where the reinforcement was and that seemed to be adequate. So it was of less concern than the adobe walls, the historic adobe walls, um, but it's it's also an important and significant part of the site. It says a lot about what O'Keefe's life was like there and the things she was worried about. And um, I'm really delighted that the museum has been um, studying it and um, it's a little hard to access. So I don't know how um, likely it will be to be part of tours, but I would imagine, um, I can imagine a future, um, perhaps film at the visitor center that might take you inside. Yeah, I, I, I could see that being a popular question right now as there's like movies being made about, you know, about and in Los Alamos um, that are coming out soon, so. Well, and, and um, I think, it's it's neat to think about, and I think the the tours do a great job about the fact that this was O'Keefe was very independent and self sufficient in Abiquiu. She had the garden for her vegetables. Um, she did a lot of preserving. Um, she was thinking about things back then that we are are concerned about today. And I think she would be probably on the. I, I'm definitely putting words in her mouth, but I think um, she would appreciate our interest in global and climate change. And I suspect. Um, be using her art to um, to talk about that. Definitely. Um, a couple of folks also ask, um, I'm going to synthesize and say maybe just a general sort of like climate issues within the homes or the sites themselves. Um, how did the cement stucco um, interrupt that or how did it help that maybe? Um, just general like humidity versus breathability and things like that. It's a good question. I think um, one of the, you, any of you who've been to the site know that there's actually, there are no paintings in the house. Um, that the, and I think that's a decision that was um, made by the museum in a very responsible way. Um, that the house is not suitable for what we would consider museum quality climate control conditions today. At the same time, there is furniture and clothing which are also important part of the collections and that we need to consider. It was not a detailed part of our study because we were looking much more on a macro level, um, but it's something that Michael Henry, our conservation engineer, is very, very aware of. Um, we are, um, Adobe itself is a fantastic material, has fantastic passive properties. It absorbs heat during the day and then releases it at night. That's one of the reasons why Adobe homes have traditionally been so comfortable. And that, of course, works well in terms of um, maintaining a relatively steady climate inside. Um, the, I'm not sure how much the cement stucco modifies that. Michael could tell me, I'm sure, if he were here. Um, but um, the reality is it's, the house is also very much an inside-outside house. You know, doors and windows were open, screen doors were left during the summer to um, capture ventilation. Um, and um, the windows themselves are... Uh, much more vulnerable to um, temperature change than we would use in a building if we were making it today. So um, I think there's, we all believe there's a lot that can be done to enhance the, um, the climate inside the 
the building while not altering its um, significant original features, which was also an important part of, um, of our brief. Thank you, Pamela. Um, and finally, maybe we can we can start to end with um, with some of these questions. Um, I think these are a little bit more personal. What stood out to you? What surprised you? A couple of questions mm -hmm. came in like that. What was your takeaway? Anything anything that you might want to share with us? Mm -hmm. Any particular stories that maybe stand out to you personally? Mm -hmm. Well, I. Um... I first encountered the site probably in the 1990s before it was open to the public. So for me, it's always been a site of mystery. Um, and I remember driving my rental car up around and sort of peeking over the walls and saying, is this the place really, you know, and then um, driving by. And then I took a tour of the house probably in the 90s or early 2000s when and, and and was very frustrated because you know I had to come through and couldn't spend much time so for me um frankly the huge luxury was be was being able to spend time there um to be there in the morning and in the afternoon to see how the light plays across the walls and was and kind of illuminates different parts of the landscape um and definitely to feel her presence I mean I I never would have dared knock on the door if she had been there, um, but I would have given anything to have been able to talk with her. Um, and I think you get the closest thing is to be there in the house for sure. Definitely. And let's see, um, we are sitting at 9.58 um, mountain time at least. Um, so with these last couple of minutes, I guess we can begin to wrap up. Um, a couple of folks mentioned, um, we, a couple of folks are mentioning in, in the chat also, um, there, there's a lot of material um, regarding the homes and especially changes that have been made. And what's going to happen over these next couple of weeks, um, this, um, this talk has been recorded. Um, we will be editing it and bringing it all together and then sharing it out with you. With anybody that registered, you will get a link um, when that video is completed and it's put up onto our website. But along with that, um, I'll be sending out an email with any appropriate um, resources that I think might be good to share with you. Any books that we've mentioned and things like that, um, we will be sure to share all of those things with you. Um, so you can look out for that within the next um, within the next week or two at the very latest. Um, that's usually when that goes out. Um, Pamela, I want to say thank you so much. Um, if there are any last things that you want to share with us or anything like that, um, please feel free. And if not, just want to say thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Well, it's been such a pleasure um, to to um, revisit what we did and. Um, think about how to share it with a larger group and also such an honor to have worked on the on the project. So thank you for inviting me and thanks to the museum for inviting us there in the first place. Thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a great rest of your day. Have a great Wednesday. Bye, Pamela. Bye-bye. Thank you.